Thank you very much, uh, Len. And I want to thank uh, everybody who's put this event together, uh, including Alia Asaji and uh, Ted Begsma and um, definitely Katerina. So I'm thinking of you, Katerina, right now. Um, I'm speaking to you from a redwood forest uh, on the north coast of California, formerly land of the Pomo people and recently a region of US um, besieged by wildfire. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you. It's a pleasure to speak with people who are serious Begsun readers and also really engaged with the world. And that doesn't happen every day, so that's a real pleasure. I've uh, been uh, inspired by all the talks I've been able to listen to and um, the discussions that have followed. I hope there will be some uh, resonances with um, some of the things I'm going to try to uh, talk about uh, today. Like many of you, I read Bexon uh, because I think he has something to say to us today. Uh, not because I attribute any intention to Mr. Bergson, but because of the way uh, his thinking uh, works. The more I read and reread Bergson, the more uh, I feel that uh, the way he thinks is particularly important um, and part of what tied up with what he has to say to us today. There's something like a problem of thought in Bergson, and this is one of the things I want to examine with you. And I think these issues have also come up in some of the talks that we have heard. Um, Last Friday, Deepesh Chakrabarti made a distinction between the global, which he considers historical, uh, and the planetary, which refers us to deep time. I take this as a slight rephrasing of a distinction he and others have made before and presented as a tension between two versions of the global, um, the uh, post-colonial global and the planetary. In facing the planetary, William Connolly takes up the charge that, quote, the post-colonial thought has bypassed environmental issues. With reference to Deleuze and William James, he advocates a planetary perspective which refers us to the knowledge frame of the earth sciences. He barely mentions Bergson. I'd like to consider what Bergson might have to contribute to this conversation. Picking up the post-colonial from its decolonizing edge, and I realize those two things are not identical, uh, our point of departure will be Bergson's critique of the knowledge apparatus of intelligence in creative evolution. So there has also been, um, this has been evoked in, in other uh, talks and discussions. Uh, and I will suggest that it decolonizes what it is to know within an argument that links duration with life in a register of the planetary that is quite different from the ones professors Connolly and Chakrabarti proposed to us. It's raining here and the rain is like pouring down on my roof. Um, I'm sorry if that is uh, getting in the way or if there's anything I can do about it. I'm in a kind of a cabin here in the middle of the woods and which I use as a study and um, we're very, very happy for the rain. So can you hear? Is it okay? Okay. Um, so we will let Bergson guide us to a different understanding of the planetary. That's the, the project here. One that is no longer perhaps in tension with the post-colonial. So the critical challenge to the human faculty of intelligence is not merely a footnote to creative evolution, the work Bergson directed against Herbert Spencer in 1907. In the opening sentence of his introduction to that work, Bergson denies human intelligence its pride of place, drives it out of its dominant position above nature, transcendent to it, and embeds it within the, the deep history or the long history of its operations. Intelligence emerges as nature unfolds because evolution requires the consciousness of living beings to adapt to its conditions of existence in the physical world. The human faculty of intelligence is more than a successful adaptation. It reflects, Bex and Ranks, a perfect insertion of our body into its milieu. At its inception, Bergson argues intelligence is simply an annex to action. We're familiar with this idea from matter and memory, where perception referred us to action, not knowledge, and action was placed in relation to need, which is to say life. 
In creative evolution, a certain surplus value attaches to the adaptation that yields intelligence. It enables humans to act on the physical world to their best advantage and uses the word profit, profit. Over time, this opportunistic adaptation establishes a certain parenté or kinship between cognitive operations and matter, which exists in a temporal regime of repetition, a present that is always beginning again as Bergson put it in Matter and Memory. Intelligence imposes abstract frameworks of repetition, logics of solid geometry and physics that stabilize the world so that we can know it and master it, making possible what Bergson calls in the two sources, the greatest material success of man on the planet. But this stunning success of what Max Horkheimer will call instrumental reason comes at a cost, as you know, an inability to know or think life quote, created by life in determinate circumstances in order to act on determinate things, how could it embrace life of which it is only an aspect, an emanation or an aspect? Questions of epistemology, Bexon insists, are inseparable from questions of life. I'm sure these ideas are familiar to you as readers of creative evolution, but I don't think we take them quite seriously enough. I think we tend to let them slip by. I wanna emphasize how radical they are, how they lie at the root of what I would have been just referred to as a Bergsonian problem of thought. Intelligence cannot know life even as questions of epistemology are inseparable from questions of life. Having established these fundamental points and set out his understanding of creative evolution accordingly, Bergson devotes the last chapter of his book, chapter four, to an analysis of how human intelligence actually works. He compares what he calls its knowledge apparatus to a recently invented mechanical apparatus contrived to produce visual illusions. The cinematograph that Lumiere had recently introduced to a bedazzled public at the 1900 World's Fair. This machine projects a sequence of still images of something in motion, images taken at mathematically determined intervals. Um, thanks to Jules Marais new technology of chronophotography, and projects them onto a screen at just the speed required for us to see them, read them as continuous. The cinematic apparatus, in other words, takes stable views of instability and juxtaposes them artificially to simulate movement abstractly. It performs, in other words, a version of the operation Bergson called spatialization in time and free will, a procedure for thinking that masks duration because it schematizes time uh, change, temporal change abstractly, formatting it retrospectively as juxtaposition in homogeneous space. In creative evolution, Bergson will claim that this is simply the operational norm of intelligence. It's our usual way of thinking, given that our language in its very structure and our mathematical logics carve up the ever-changing stable, uh, the ever-changing real into stable repeatable units, the equivalent of Marais still photographs, which we then schematize or link together according to clock time. Bergson Spencer's philosophy exemplifies this cognitive protocol. It pretends to give an account of real becoming of genesis or evolution when it actually only reconstitutes evolution with fragments of what has already evolved, the way the cinematograph reconstitutes movement with still images. But he also adds this spatial metaphor. He says that uh, Spencer's philosophy works the way children put together a puzzle, um, put together the given pieces of a puzzle to reconstitute an image they already had in mind. So in the case of Spencer's theory of evolution, what does this puzzle image display? Uh, it, uh, I'm quoting now from Spencer, the completely civilized man. This is the image his puzzle yields when he puts it together um, in a theory of evolution that overlaps quite explicitly with the story of European civilization, which affirms the exceptionalism of Western man that ideologically undergirds the colonial project. Were there time, I would say more about how the uh, concept of ideology emerges in the early 19th century uh, around the time of the colonial conquest in Algeria um, and becomes an official instrument with Francois Guizot 
who uh, becomes the Minister of Education in France in the, during the July monarchy, and how this concept is then racialized in Gobineau's essay on the inequality of the human race, races in 1855. So we're talking about this basically the same period, which explicitly affirmed African peoples to be inherently incapable of ever acceding to civilization. Post-colonial philosophers have illuminated the links between the myth of the Greek miracle of the origin story of Western philosophy, the theology of civilization, Western exceptionalism and colonial violence. If I speak of decolonizing in relation to Bergson's critique of intelligence and creative evolution, it's because his argument in fact challenges the whole package. Creative evolution is such a dense and challenging work that it's easy to miss the fact that Bergson identifies the knowledge apparatus of intelligence with the whole history of Western philosophy. I missed that the first times I read uh, Creative Evolution and, and then began to pay attention to it and it's quite striking. The whole history of Western philosophy and he runs through it in detail and practices of modern science, even as it critiques Spencer's theory of evolution which places civilized rational man as the perfect culm culmination of evolution. In other words, Bergson throws the Greek miracle back into the history of natural processes and denies it the capacity to know life of which it is only an emanation, an aspect. Now, decolonizing what it is to know is not an abstract concern today um, as the talk we just heard made quite clear very nicely. Linda Tuiwai Smith, professor of Maori and Indigenous Studies at the University of Waikato in New Zealand, is concerned with policy decisions that determine what knowledge and what kinds of knowledge will be taught to Indigenous communities in New Zealand. She also thinks about what kinds of re academic research methodologies might be appropriate when Indigenous people find themselves both subject and object of research. Although she does not mention Bergson, her critique of what she calls the Western system of knowledge lines up with his critique of intelligence in striking ways. Western, uh, the system of the West, she argues, considers understanding in terms of measurement and frames indigenous cultures through spatialized representations and then colonizes indigenous spaces. She stresses the importance of decolonizing knowledge practices as a form of resistance, citing the poet activist Audre Lorde's celebrated maxim, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. It's worth noting that many indigenous scholars prefer decolonizing perspectives to post-colonial ones. What, it's over, one scholar, scholar quips, they've left? Colonialism, these thinkers suggest, as far, is far from over, and we heard echoes of this again in the, the talk uh, we heard uh, a little while ago. To be absorbed into global markets, they claim, is in a sense to be colonized. We might say the same thing of being subjected to an earth crisis in the age of the Anthropocene and subject to what the global studies scholar Saskia Sassen has called expulsion, an effect of global capitalism through which, uh, uh, which implies not merely exclusion due to various forms of inequality, but expulsion from the conditions needed to maintain life. The planetary perspective in Bergson. Neither indigenous climate activists nor Bergson suggest that one should abandon Western reason. In what we could call a trademark methodolo methodological gesture, Bergson poses intelligence and intuition as extreme points of the two opposed tendencies of thought. He insists on quote, all the imagination, all the imaginable degrees from intelligence to intuition and suggests that where one places oneself on that spectrum depends on what one wants to know. If you seek mastery over the physical world, technical advantage or profit, you will slide toward the knowledge apparatus of intelligence. However, Bergson reminds us, quote, as living beings, we depend on the planet in which we find ourselves, la planète où nous sommes. And when it's a question of, quote, our place in the ensemble of nature, when in other words, it's a question of planetary concerns, quote, the light of intuition will be required to illuminate them, 
the planetary perspective, in other words, reveals the stakes of the relations between epistemology and life. What is thrilling uh, about reading Bergson is that this philosopher undertakes to treat what cannot be said conceptually or discursively, duration, change, or time as it happens. Frederick Worms's work has demonstrated the remarkable rigor with which this quixotic program has, is carried out. What this implies, though, is that Bergson's epistemological critique, so explicit and comprehensive in creative evolution, for me, it's all his writings, because to think duration, Bergson insists early on, requires the breaking of many frames. Taking up specifically relations between epistemology and life, he tells us that to think the sinuosities of life, which he associates with the flux of time, fluid or supple concepts are required. This also came up earlier this morning in, in a talk. And it won't be enough just to talk about this need for conceptual flexibility. Bergson's philosophical practice will perhaps will have to perform this suppleness. So this is what I want to address now, sort of um, moving through a number of his works and um, a number of his concepts to try to uh, really follow the lines of force of this um, suppleness. But when we read Bergson with attention to what I am calling his problem of thought, we get a different picture from the one Deleuze advanced when he argued that creative evolution represents a radical break in Bergson's thought, replacing a psychological framework, one that concerns individual human consciousness with a ontological one. I wanna propose that a notion of consciousness in fact runs through Bergson's thought, that it evolves as he thinks, and that in an altered form, it is crucial both to Bergson's notion of life and to the planetary register he introduces. Toward the end of this talk, I'm gonna to suggest um, all too quickly, I'm afraid, uh, that there um, a relation between Bergson's uh, supple treatment of what he calls consciousness, for lack of a better word, he says, and what Gilbert Simondon calls information. Our next step then is to review um, a few concrete features of Bergson's thought in order to suggest how his thinking um, plays out over time. And now I'm gonna try to do this um, share screen, bear with me. Um, because there will be some, some quotes of Bergson and I know it's hard to listen to them. Okay. In Time and Free Will, Bergson invites us into scenarios that let us imaginatively apprehend duration as perpetual change because it, as he has, as I've indicated, it can't be uh, expressed conceptually or discursively. He uh, initiates us into intuition, which he defines as thinking in duration by giving us access to what is a reality for your consciousness, concrete qualitative becoming. So I'm suggesting that that's in a sense a strategic uh, uh, point of entry. Matter and memory sets the problem of individual consciousness within the larger problematic of the triple problem of matter consciousness and the relation between them. The point of departure is consciousness. We open our eyes onto a world of images or we close them and shut this world down. These images which act on one another and react accordingly make up what Bergson calls a material universe. He then introduces living matter into this universe, the image he calls my body and defines as a center of action. And this is where consciousness comes in again, action requires conscious perception. Since the material universe in which my body finds itself from the start is a world in motion and so in time, memory must come into being alongside perception. It doubles perception like a lining and for two reasons. First, it makes possible the temporal synthesis required for perception to occur. Past, present and future must be experienced continuously and second, because the present is always on its way to becoming past, 
perception must retain the past in order to complete its operation. Erickson defines memory here as a faculty of consciousness that makes possible a quote, conservation and accumulation of the past in the present. It remains virtually active in the present. This is what it means when Bergson says that living beings, unlike inert ones, absorb time. And this is then a crucial distinction for him between the inert and the living. And, and that question also had come up earlier today. So I hope maybe we can talk about it later. Perception interrupts automaticity, the action and reaction of material elements because it's lined with memory that thickens duration, that's Bergson's phrase, into a zone of indeterminacy such that a living being can choose its response to an external impingement instead of reacting automatically to it according to the time of repetition. When Bergson maintains that living beings are different in kind from inert ones, it is because inert things as quote, brute matter do not absorb time in this way because they lack memory, which is to say consciousness. Up to this point then, consciousness is limited to living beings from higher vertebrates on up and is their defining feature. In matter and memory, then duration becomes a continuity of past, present, and future. At the same time, as we have seen, memory introduces what Bergson now calls an incommensurability between what precedes and what follows. This is what makes voluntary action possible or freedom, creativity, or invention. While the rain is getting really loud, the trees are very happy. This is how Bergson rephrases what he called unity and multiplicity and figured by melody in time and free will that Leia was talking about earlier, such that duration begins to take on a life of its own. Consciousness more and more becomes a structure that attaches to memory as a function or operation, a fluid concept that Bergson will eventually radically rephrase as an operation of quote, holding on to the past and anticipating the future, which isn't how we usually think of memory. In creative evolution, Bergson orients the happening of time toward the future on the trajectory of the arrow of time. Instead of attending to the becoming past he emphasized in matter and memory, um, instead of it emphasizing that uh, becoming past, time passes through living matter, creating new forms as it goes. Duration has become a duration of the real in connection with evolution. As the individual invented its response to impingement from the external world instead of reacting to it in matter and memory. So duration invents its paths through living matter in creative evolution. Fluid concepts work analogically in Bergson who uh, brings us along with him when he proposes, let's follow the thread of analogy. Suivant le fil de l'analogie. We can begin to appreciate the suppleness of Bergson's concepts here, with a notorious Elan Vital reinscribes both features memory enjoyed in matter and memory the operation of temporal synthesis and the thickening of duration into a zone of indeterminacy or of active creative invention. Put another way, to say that duration passes through living matter presupposes something like the absorption of time associated with memory in Bergson's earlier work. When he writes in Creative Evolution that time is invention or is nothing at all, he reinscribes the structure of voluntary action enjoyed by living beings precisely because they absorb time thanks to memory as a faculty of consciousness. If creative evolution begins to change course with respect to Bergson's earlier work, it is not, I would suggest, be by abandoning a psychological register for an ontological one, as Deleuze proposed, but through a rapprochement of the two terms Bergson radically separated in matter and memory, brute matter and living matter. Quote, if we wanted to find a term of comparison for the living organism in the inorganic world, he writes in Creative Evolution, we should assimilate it not to a determinate material object, but rather to the totality of the material universe. Bergson therefore does not override the difference in kind he established earlier on the level of the individual 
he adjusts or corrects it with respect to the ensemble, which is to say the planetary. He does this through an analogy between the planet as a living system and the living being as a living system. From this planetary perspective, Bergson is able to write duration into brute matter as a quote, duration imminent to the whole of the universe. This move, which concerns, among other things, the relation of isolated physical systems to, quote, ever vaster systems up to and including the solar system in its entirety, as he puts it in Creative Evolution, has to do with a scientific shift in the conception of matter that's been kind of contemporary or concurrent. Instead of construing matter in mechanical terms as an automaticity of action and reaction, science now considers it in dynamic terms as, quote, energy and movement. I think the dynamic physics of James Clerk Maxwell would be pertinent here. And Bergson explicitly mentions this. I think it's in chapter two of uh, Creative Evolution. Matter, Bergson writes, considered as an undivided whole must be in flux. It is, quote, in this respect, he writes, that we are preparing the way to a rapprochement between the inert and the living, where the two operate interactively on the planetary level. Quote, the whole of the universe, Bergson writes, is a natural system, l'univers dur. What this means, as he explains in La Pensée et le Mouvement, speaking, a uh, mouvement, speaking of the universe is that, quote, if we could embrace it, speaking of the universe, as an inorganic whole, but interwoven with organic beings, we would see it ceaselessly taking on forms as new, as unforeseeable as our states of consciousness. Analogy, again, is doing the work here. We remember that in Matter and Memory, Bergson affirmed that memory introduces, quote, an incommensurability between what precedes and what follows. He rephrases this idea in the definition of time he gives in duration and simultaneity, the work that carries his argument with Einstein, where he states that time, quote, implies a before and an after. On the level of the planetary, then, the structure of memory slides into definition, the definition of time. But Bergson adds the proviso that the difference between before and after must be registered to be real. What this means is that, quote, one cannot imagine time without inserting consciousness into it. Is this a symptom of the dreaded spiritualism often attributed to Bergson? Maybe except that Bergson adds this comment. The word consciousness, he says, would, be, would create misunderstanding were we to take it anthropomor anthropomorphically, that's his word, in order, quote, to imagine a thing that endures, une chose qui dure, he explains, there is no need to take one's own memory and transport it, even attenuate it, into the interior of the thing. It's the opposite course we must follow. Memory in Bergson is not exclusive to humans. Bergson speaks explicitly of animal memory, la mémoire chez l'animal in creative evolution. The memory at play in the duration of the universe then does not attach to my consciousness. It's not psychological in this sense. It's an impersonal memory, a memory of reality itself. I think Leah uh, made some mention of this earlier today. How might we construe this? Bergson identifies it with transition, as Leah indicated, with the interval between the before and the after of time. If, as he writes in L'énergie spirituelle, the first function of consciousness is, quote, to retain what is no longer, to anticipate what is not yet, impersonal memory would be an operation, not a faculty, moving the former into or across the latter. And this might be why in Creative Evolution, Bergson emphasizes the richness of the interval in his critique of the cinematographic, which precisely effaces the interval, 
that is the core of the critique of the cinematographic, which is to say the critique of intelligent reason. Quote, there is more in the transition, he writes, than in the series of states. The chronophotographic cuts, the states, that is the chronophotographic cuts or stills projected by the cinematographic and the cognitive apparatus. So once what has been called consciousness, and as he says, again, I repeat, for lack of a better word, begins to overlap with time, it also begins to overlap with life. Strictly speaking, Bergson writes, everything that is living could be consciousness, could be conscious. In principle, consciousness is coextensive with life. Most expansively, he affirms in duration and simultaneity that the impersonal consciousness or memory that attaches to the duration of the universe is, quote, the link among all individual consciousnesses as between those consciousnesses and the rest of nature, which is the part that I think is important and, and gets neglected. Um, this is where the rapprochement of living matter and brute matter becomes explicit. And I take this to introduce the importance of something like a relation to milieu. Claude Bernard insisted that life must always be thought together with milieu. Jacob van Uxkul and then Merleau-Ponty rewrite this notion as Umwelt. So this is something that isn't that Bergson doesn't thematize in particular, but I think that when one goes back from reading Merleau-Ponty and others back into the Bergson, you can recognize its importance. Um, and this is where we enter fully into the planetary as it interests me, where the quote, life of things, la vie des choses, already a, quite a weird notion uh, if you take it out of context and the life of living beings cannot be completely separated from one another. So taken out of context, expressions such as the life of things could support charges of spiritualism, vitalism, or some dreadful combination of the two. But this would be to neglect the movement of Bergson's thought, the practice of inclusive restatement that moves his argument along and holds it together without submitting it to the knowledge apparatus of intelligence. We might consider the supple work of restatement we have been trying to track as analogous to the operation of temporal synthesis itself as Bergson thinks it, which hinges on the interval, enabling in this sense that thinking in duration that Bergson identifies with intuition, the only mode of knowing appropriate to the planetary. Now I'm going to say just a couple of words um, about Simon Don. If one did not take seriously Bergson's critical delimitation of the powers of intelligence, what I am calling the decolonizing of what it is to know, all this might just seem just uh, like an idiosyncratic practice, even a literary one. But we find a similar response to the problem of thinking the real in Gilbert Simon Don's book on individuation, individuation in light of notions of form and information, which works across the boundaries of philosophy and science, contemporary scientific thought, uh, including uh, from a basis of microphysics and quantum theory. This is not an obvious association since Simon Don, 1929 to 1989, explicitly distances himself from Bergson. Uh, as so many others do, including his teachers, Merleau-Ponty and Conguillem, whose name has, Bergson, whose name has been clouded with a fog of vitalist associations, even as he, even as Simon Don, I believe, takes up fundamental features of Bergson's work, renews them, and carries them forward. Although he doesn't explicitly repeat Bergson's comprehensive critique of intelligence, he does frame his study of individuation of the individual and individuation, which presupposes what he calls a pre-individual state. He frames this as a contestation of Aristotle's metaphysics of hylomorphism, of construing substance as formed matter. And so he could be said to offer his own challenge to the Greek miracle. Like Bergson, he insists on the need for a fundamental reform of philosophical concepts in order to account for the happening of time. 
Like Bergson, he displays a philosophical appreciation of the powers of analogy. Like Bergson, he insists on a notion of the real, scientifically, explicitly scientifically based in Simondon's case, as distinct from logics of the true. So uh, I won't go into this at too much length, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a sample of um, how I think uh, Simondon is carrying out his, his own kind of reform of philosophical concepts. So bear with me for just a page. Here is a sampling of the conceptual reform uh, Simondon calls for. The virtual ceases to be an abstract concept, which frankly I think it remains in Deleuze. It is construed as potential energy, which is real. Identity cannot be understood as self-sameness because it must be thought as a it must be thought as a plus qu'un, a more than one, because it includes potential energy, which opens it up internally to the transformations of becoming. Information is not understood cybernetically, but as real intensity that operates through polarization on a quantum model. Information in this sense is what introduces potential energy into a system. And Simondon's reformed concepts do not remain discrete self-enclosed packets of meaning. As in Bergson, they overlap in their operations as they pertain to various levels of scale. And so potential energy, which operates on the level of ions, quote, teaches us to think the reality of relations. Information becomes, quote, that through which the individuation operates. Ultimately, individuation, being, becoming, and relation all converge with time, understood as the relation of a before to an after. Time, which Bergson characterized in his conclusion to duration and simultaneity as, quote, the very stuff of our existence and of all things becomes for Simondon reality that modifies itself, which is to say ontogenesis. So I would stress the difference between what Deleuze called ontology, which I think remains an ontology of being, uh, Deleuze makes a kind of Heideggerian allusion at one point to what Simondon elaborates as ontogenesis, which is really a kind of ontology of time. The proximities between Bergson and Simondon invite us to consider Bergson's fluid treatment of consciousness, for want of a better word, in relation to Simondon's revised understanding of real predominantly biochemical information as it operates in relation to milieu or umwelt. Uh, and this kind of question of the relation between uh, information and memory is extremely important to very contemporary uh, analyses of the physiology of plants, which and something called plant memory. Simondon also suggests what might be at stake in the Bergsonian notion of the planetary that I've tried to sketch out. There is an ethics, Simondon wrote, to the extent that there is information. That is signification that overcomes a disparity amongst the elements of being. The value of an act is not in its universalizable character according to the norm. According to the norm it implies but the efficacy of its real integration into a network of acts that makes up becoming. This is what I call uh, livingness. And this too, this uh, something like the, the ecological substance of this kind of eth what Simondon calls an ethics, finds an anticipatory echo in Bergson who asks already in matter and memory, um, can one consider the neurological system to be alive, quote, without the organism that nourishes it, without the atmosphere where the organism breathes, without the earth that this atmosphere bathes, without the sun around which the earth gravitates? And he adds, isn't the fiction of an isolated material object somewhat absurd because this object borrows its physical properties from the relations it maintains with all the others? and owes each of its determinations and therefore its very existence to the place it occupies in the whole of the universe. 
The question of the planetary then, of our place in the ensemble of nature, our, our dependence on la planète où nous sommes, the planets which, the planet that we live in, where we are, is embedded in Bergson's thought. It interweaves the organic and the inorganic within a living, ever-changing system. It is itself interwoven with a critique of intelligence that channel, challenges not only Western man's exceptionalism, but human exceptionalism more broadly and suggests a link between the two. And now to, to conclude, one of the most prescient features of Bergson's challenge to the Western system of knowledge is his warning that, quote, the path of intelligence leads to the loss of a distinction between the living and the artificial. Here's a case in point. Very recently, uh, I'm trying to get out of this now. Okay. Um, excuse me. We have recently welcomed to the planet a new kind of being, the Xenobot, a living robot manufactured to clean up pollutants of various sorts. It belongs to the practical knowledge of climate engineers, our planetary designers. The Xenobot is fabricated from living cells taken from the legs of frogs. Symptomatic of the confusion Bergson warned us of, it has been characterized authoritatively by some as the first living machine and by others as an entirely new life form that has never existed before on earth. In this technological research terrain and the markets that support it, devitalized life packaged in as isolated systems, bio bricks, artificial life forms, et cetera, becomes the basis for a new form of resource extraction, one that extracts profit, not from the deposits deep in geological time, but from life itself. What I call the privatization of life does little to help us grapple, grapple with a response to a global earth crisis. And this is where we have to be careful, careful about invoking the term life and why I prefer to speak of livingness. Bergson's point concerning the absurdity of the fiction of an isolated material object is all the more compelling today when we have lost the distinction between the living and the artificial. And if you read uh, some of the blogs of biotech uh, scientists, it's, they will detail that loss of distinction for us. Um, we live in this absurd world where artificial life forms are manufactured as such isolated uh, commodities subject to what is known as, quote, environmental release when they are removed from the laboratory. Even though this release entails simply being deposited wherever the market sends them. These life forms do not live anywhere. The very notion of environment becomes problematic. To conclude then, let's uh, briefly uh, return to the question of tensions between the post-colonial perspective and the earth sciences planetary one. In his influential essay, The Climate of History, Professor Chakrabarty analyzes the problem this way. Post-colonial thought has unmasked the humanist notion of universal man. He has been demystified as provincially European, white, male, etc. But now we face a real universality in the forms of absolute threat and earth crisis, a threat of extinction. The solution of Chakrabarty is to invoke species thinking against the background of what he calls a universal history of life that he suggests the geological sciences propose to us in order to proceed in search of a response to this crisis. Professor Connolly appears to humanists to engage with scientific knowledge that might give us purchase on deep or geological time and the nuances of planetary dynamics, the knowledge of expert stratigraphers and geologists and climate scientists enabled by big data computational powers and algorithms that can track dynamics of amplification uh, and identify tipping points. Considered from Bergson's perspective, the notion, uh, this notion of the planetary and the universalizing category of the species, species clings to and fulfills the wildest dreams of a notion of human intelligence 
that maintains its pride of place above this deep earth history that it knows by measurements now that technological powers of computation have themselves reached sublime levels of speed and complexity. From Bergson's perspective, this is all well and good, but intelligent reason will always miss the concretely real and will miss life. The appeal to reason in these discourses which invoke geological time and geological agency correspond quite precisely, I think, with the workings of intelligence as Bergson figured them through the cinematographic apparatus. The history of life, only a sliver, a tiny sliver of geological time, is told on the basis of fossil records, immobilized bits of deep time's history, traces of dead time that we look back on and juxtapose in relations arbitrarily, um, in relation to arbitrarily determined units of time, epochs, periods, eras, eons, or just units of millions of years. You can find this history of geological time animated as by a cinematograph on any number of YouTube websites, YouTube presentations. And when you look closely at the notion of species thinking, you see that not unlike Spencer's theory of evolution, which ends with civilized man, it becomes identified with reason, with civilized man now figured by a community of engineers. I fear that the desire for political will to tackle the problem of the earth crisis might amount to an attempt to rally support for this community of engineers and earth scientists who it is hoped will set the planet right, fulfilling precisely the fantasy of geological agency that in the name of the Anthropocene undergirds this planetary perspective yet another version of what Bergson called the greatest mastery of man on the planet. Granting the human species, quote, geological agency, taking, taking as pretext the institutional authority of the Anthropocene discourse, reinforces human exceptionalism. On the one hand, it endows the human with the sublime force of the inorganic real gathered over the sublime abysses of deep time. On the other, it suggests a yearning for human mastery of those forces through an appeal to reason, the logics of the earth sciences that lines up pretty well with Spencer's evolutionary discourse of civilized man. In other words, the rationality of the planetary wood from the decolonizing perspective of Bergson align with an epistemology which is separated from life and cannot know life, perhaps not the most fruitful approach to the problem of mass extinction. When we contrast this geological notion of the planetary with Bergson's perspective, it appears that geological time merely extends the historicist time of human history onto a scale that numbs the imagination. The appeal to geological time ushers in a scene of the mathematical sublime, one that distracts us from the natural sublime that begins to engulf us. I'm thinking of the fires of California but where the specific mechanism of this Kantian sublime breaks down, we are not sheltered from this awesome destructive force beneath the transcendental horizon. If Bergson is right, reason itself attaches to that long history of natural unfolding. In the context of feminism, racism, and post-colonial struggles, Audre Lorde's decolonizing maxim, the master's tools will not dismantle the master's house, taught us that one cannot effectively resist domination by using the master's cognitive apparatus. We might call the maxim sociocentric, to borrow Connolly's phrase, but what if our post-colonial moment, if that is what it still is, one that coincides with an overheated global capitalism and an overheating planet, were precisely the exception that, perceive, that proves this rule. What if this were the very moment in which it is precisely the master's tools that have in fact been dismantling the master's house, the house of being, if you will, which has been organized through structures of domination such that it's the only house we, all living beings, have. Does this mean that the post-colonial is in conflict with the planetary? Or does our retournement of Lord's important maxim, which adjusts for scale of injustice, simply reinforce the post-colonial, which is also to say the decolonizing message? I think that Bergson's decolonizing of what it is to know reveals clearly that the knowledge apparatus of white Western male exceptionalism is also an apparatus of human exceptionalism and that these tools cannot enlighten us 
concerning our place in the planet because they cannot think life. The tools that have enabled, quote, the greatest success of man on the planet, even when euphemistically called geological, geological agency, have begun to dismantle that planet. They are not the tools that are going to restore it to us or protect it from us. Thank you.